Jim's work is really exciting because he's kind of been a pioneer in many things, so including uh, multivariate methods and decoding um, for fMRI, um, and also for kind of pushing this idea of representational spaces. And one of my personal favorites, I think he's maybe among the earliest um, continuously in his lab has been pushing this like open science tool. So um, sharing data early on and sharing tools and things like that, and training lots of people that um, continue this tradition. And a couple of lesser known facts that I personally really like. Um, so he was one of Paul Neal's last students when before Paul Neal sent him and everyone else an email saying he didn't want to be their advisors anymore because he wanted to try to do other things. Um, and also he is uh, trained as a clinical neuropsychologist. So he was the other clinical psychologist in the department, that one me, and we're both probably the least likely of anyone that you might imagine in the department. Um, anyway, so excited to hear about Jim's take on representational spaces and how they relate to cognitive maps. Please uh, join me welcome. Thanks, Luke, and uh, th thanks for revealing that embarrassing fact about my back, about my training in clinical psychology. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk. Uh, I've, I've rearranged uh, my talk. So th th those of you who who heard my talk last year will will notice that it's quite different. I usually focus on this um, algorithm that we've developed for aligning the information spaces across brains. I'm going to mention that, but instead of spending half of my talk on that, I think I've got three slides. And I'm going to really focus on um, this idea of uh, representational spaces or information spaces and the geometry within that space, how uh, the representation for different um, items, different concepts, different percepts are related to each other as a cognitive map and how that, those cognitive maps are, are highly similar across subjects how they change across processing pathways, reflecting how information is processed, and um, how they change with attention. Uh, um, uh, Dollars yesterday talked about how they change with learning, and then, uh, and then how if you look at the residuals around the representational, the, the cognitive map for individuals, so you have an average uh, uh, cognitive map across individuals. And then if you look at the residuals around that representational geometry, it's a very sensitive measure of how brains differ from each other. So I hope this all comes together. Um, as I said, this is a, a different order, so I may stumble more than, even more than often uh, than usual. So these are the people in the lab. There's one person missing who's just uh, joined recently, um, and I'll be talking about much of their work. So I'll, you'll see their names come up as I uh, present different pieces of information. And this is the outline for what I want to cover. So first I'll, t I'll talk about the general idea that we believe that information is encoded in fine-grained topographies as uh, population response pattern vectors. That should make sense soon. So we, we, we work in this framework as a conceptual and computational framework of high-dimensional information spaces which makes the, the problem very tractable because we just use linear algebra to, uh, to analyze this. And we look at the representational geometry of vectors. I'll make that very clear. And I'm going to make the point that information that's uh, embedded in the representational geometry, that's the distances between um, the vectors for different percepts or concepts, is preserved with the rotation of the coordinate axes. And I'll make kind of a... a, a, a a revolutionary or a point that may upset some of you. So I hope to see some people get, get um, agitated. Um, and then um, I'll talk about how uh, these information spaces change along processing pathways and talk about this idea of second order representational geometry, which is really a map of maps. So it's a, there's a kind of map in each uh, cortical field, and that, but, there, but there are cort multiple uh, cognitive maps for multiple fields in a processing pathway. And so really the brain map is a map of embedded local maps. Um, talk about hyperalignment, uh, how uh, these information spaces change with attention and individual differences. So this is the general idea, is that we think that uh, the information, the, 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 the patterns we measure with fMRI in cortex encode information that's specific, uh, information about what that current brain state is. And we look at these as pattern vectors in information spaces. So this just makes it a little bit more concrete. 
we have uh, a lot of the, what we do is we have people watch a movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And um, while they're watching the movie, we measure their brain activity. So this just lets you know that when you use naturalistic stimuli, you're not running a very controlled experiment. It's very interesting, very rich. Um, there's actually a, 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 a special issue of neuroimage uh, that's being prepared right now, talking about the use of naturalistic stimuli and what the advantage of that is. And these are just measures of activity in ventral temporal cortex while subjects watch this movie, measure while subjects watch this movie. And these are actually in sync. So at the same time point, this point, pattern, this pattern, supposedly are representing the same information. But you can see that they look quite different. So it's a formidable problem to see what is the shared information across these patterns. So this is the data structure that we work with. So we have a pattern of activity in cortex. And uh, so uh, we have patterns, a sequence of patterns of activity. So it's just a data matrix. It's a two-dimensional matrix where the columns are voxels or cortical vertices. And each row is the pattern of activity across the voxels in your cortical field. And so you, you can analyze this as a time series of changes in activity in one voxel, which is how most fMRI analysis was done for many years. Or you can look at what is the pattern of activity across the cortical field across voxels. And that pattern changes with time. So we take the patterns of activity in, cort in a, a cortical patch, and we vectorize the voxels. And then uh, we uh, analyze that vector as a location in this high dimensional space. So if the cortical field has 200 uh, cortical vertices in it, it's a 200 dimensional space. Uh, if we have a region of interest, like ventral temporal cortex with 1,000 vertices, it's a 1,000 dimensional space. Luckily, linear algebra has no trouble scaling up to these very high dimensional spaces. But I'm going to start with a very low dimensional space just to illustrate some concepts with illustrative data. I just, I just made these numbers up and plot. Yeah. Really quick. Uh, do all subjects have the same number of voxels in, in the area? You, 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 you can normalize them to a standard mesh, OK? But you don't have to. All, everything I'm talking about, actually, it's, it's pretty easy to, to go from one size cortical field to a different size cortical field and different subject. OK. so. There are, are four categories. There's a red category, a blue category, a green category, and a yellow category. And we're talking about a two-voxel brain, OK? So we don't have to worry about a thousand-dimensional space. We can do a two-dimensional space that's, e that's easy to illustrate. And these four categories could be faces and dogs and cars and chairs. Or they could be operations. They could be like addition in performing calculations with addition or subtraction or multiplication or, di or division. Or it could be anything like that. It could be you know, um, happy, neutral, uh, anger, and disgust. So uh, representational geometry is the distances between these vectors in, um, the re in this vector, uh, in, in this space, which is just a two-dimensional space. So if you look at the average location for the four categories, you can uh, uh, index that those distances as Euclidean distances like that, or as polar angles. Okay, and most of the work is done on the polar angles using correlation. And then that this set of distances, so red is very different from yellow and very similar to blue, is usually displayed as a uh, similarity matrix. So blue is very similar, dogs and, and faces in this two-dimensional space are very similar whereas uh, faces and shares are very different. So um, the, uh, so you can think about this as uh, uh, this space with representational geometry. And this set of, um, of, of pairwise distances or similarities is supported by the response tuning function of each unit. Now we're just talking about two units here, 
And so this is sort of like a time series. These are the four different exemplars of the red category, the four different exemplars of the green category, and so on. For voxel 1, which is x, and voxel 2, which is the y-axis. So you have these nice time series, that, and this is what the two-voxel pattern of activity would look like if you showed this as a brain image. Okay. So these brain images and these response tuning functions support this vector geometry. Now you can rotate uh, the, 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 this cloud of vectors. So just a rigid rotation. So this is a 90 degree rotation. So the red and blue is now down here, okay? But the distances are all still the same. So there's been absolutely no change in the dissimilarity matrix. But the tuning functions and the patterns that support that have changed radically. So you can see this is the tuning function for the two voxels and the patterns of activity. Now you have different tuning function, tuning response curves and different patterns of activity across two voxels. So that means that the information, if you think of the information as what is embedded in these distances between the, the, the pattern vectors, that's preserved. And the tuning functions of individual voxels are really secondary to preservation of that information. And I'm going to try to convince you that that information is it's that information that has to be preserved across subjects and, um, uh, and that really the tuning functions of individual voxels uh, really has to be thought of uh, in uh, the way it uh, supports or serves the representation of information. This is a 45 degree rotation. Again, the patterns, the, uh, uh, the voxel response tuning functions, the patterns of, of response uh, are very different, but this hasn't changed one whit. It's exactly the same. So this just shows all three with a zero degree rotation, a 45 degree rotation, and a 90 degree rotation. Nothing's changed up here. Everything has changed down here. So um, why do I uh, bring up this, the, 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 this uh, representational geometry as something that uh, is sort of the, 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 the basis for information representation? Well, we know that representational geometry is highly similar across brains. So this is from a study that uh, Andy Connolly published in our lab, uh, 2012, and he looked at the um, responses to six different types of animals, two species of insect, two species of bird, two species of uh, primate, and um, calculated the representational geometry for this six, uh, uh, six category space in each subject and look at the correlation, searchlight by searchlight, across the cortical surface. And you can see in uh, occipital cortex, lateral occipital cortex, and ventral temporal cortex, the between subjects correlation is very, very high, around 0.85, okay? So this is really conserved across subjects. But these spaces change along the processing pathways. So he identified two clusters, one cluster in early visual cortex, and a second cluster in lateral occipital and ventral temporal cortex that had very different similarity structures. So the similarity structure in ventral temporal and lateral occipital cortex, which is called the LOC or lateral occipital complex, shows the expected organization by the similarity of animals. The primates cluster together, the birds cluster together, the insects cluster together, and the primates are more like birds than they are like insects. So the, the vertebrates cluster together as compared to the invertebrates. So you have this nice representation of the semantic structure of our knowledge about animals uh, reflected in the representational geometry in the LOC complex. You don't see that in the early visual cortex. This is kind of crazy. You have things like the, uh, um, the, the birds are more like the monkeys and things like that. And this actually is very well predicted by a, a, a model based on um, the V1 uh, neuron response properties. So we have a very different similarity structure in early visual cortex that's related to visual properties and in uh, higher order cortex that's related on semantic similarities. 
Now, in a later study, Andy again had 12 species of animal, and this time he had uh, three taxonomic categories again, this time mammals and reptiles and bugs, insects, although he, has, he included arachnids, that's why he had to call them bugs and not insects. Um, and then he, he, he picked out uh, uh, animals that were uh, considered tame, safe, low, low threat, and animals that are high threat, things like scorpions and cobras. Okay? And so he was able to build similarity structures uh, based on um, ratings of, the, of, of these uh, stimuli using mechanical Turk. And he found that there was one similarity structure if they were asked to rate them in the terms of the similarity of their th threat potential. One, another similarity based on the similarity of the taxonomic class of the species. And a third similarity based on the, um, the visual properties of the stimuli. So we analyzed the stimuli with a V1 model. And then he uh, did a cluster analysis of the um, representational geometries in different parts of cortex. And he had the sequence of areas, so from three in the back up to six and seven in front, okay, in the ventral pathway. And he found that the, um, the, uh, cor the, the, the relative, uh, the, the, the extent to which the visual similarity structure was seen in the measured rep uh, representational geometry from real activity steadily decreased from the back to the front, whereas the representation of the taxonomic class increased. And you can visualize this in a multidimensional scaling plot. Now, so each one of these little diamonds is a brain area, one of these clusters. And the uh, squares are the model spaces. So you have similarity structures, cognitive maps, based on subject ratings and based on the brain activity. And it's, you know, it's all been projected into this two-dimensional space of similarities between the similarity structures. So we're getting into the second idea of a second-order representational geometry. And what you can see is that uh, as you progress from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 and 6 and 7, the uh, location in this two-dimensional representational geometry goes from the visual model up to the taxonomy model. He saw, found another set of regions in the right inferior, right uh, superior temporal sulcus, so areas five, six, and seven. And here you can see the taxonomy is still dominant in the more, most posterior area, but becomes less uh, um, evident in the representational geometry as you move forward in this part of the visual processing pathway. And by contrast, the uh, similarity to the threat similarity structure increases. And you can see that in this, in this multidimensional scaling plot of these areas where it goes from something that's similar to taxonomy to something that's very close to the threat model. So representational geometry is not one thing in the brain. It's a set of structures that varies by cortical region. And these are very meaningful changes now, here's another example for in face processing. This was done by Swarup Guntapali with Ida Gobini. And they looked at uh, responses while people looked at images of faces. And so they found uh, two clusters. There's a cluster in um, uh, right prefrontal cortex and then a cluster in visual cortex going into ventral temporal cortex. And they have very different similarity structures. And this is what they look like. So in the uh, more posterior area, the, re the ve vector geometry, representational geometry, reflects the head angle. And it's a beautiful structure. So this is a full right profile, three-quarter right profiles right next to it, then full face, three-quarter left profile, full left profile, left full profile is close to full profile. So it's a very regular structure based on the similarity of the angles of, of profile. In the uh, inferior frontal face area, it was a completely different representational geometry, which showed that the uh, different images of the same individual, like this bl blue individual, this uh, woman. Here's another woman over here. There's the green man and the yellow man. 
So this is now clustered by identity. So the inferior frontal area represents identity independent of head view, whereas the visual cortical area represents head angle independent of identity. So again, different kinds of information are represented in the uh, representational geometry in different parts of the same brain, and everything's connected. Okay, it's not. So the, these these areas are are, are uh, you know in the perceptual process are working with each other for uh, representing this kind of different information. So back to uh, Indiana Jones and measuring these patterns of brain activity. So now that I've kind of introduced what we, how we think about um, uh, representation, uh, rep representational geometry and rotating this representational geometry, I'll get this to stop. There we go. Okay. We think about it this way. So we have subject one and subject two watching the movie, same movie. And each pattern of response is a vector in each individual's three. Now we have a three-dimensional representational space in this illustration. And there's a new vector with each time point. So it kind of looks like this. So with each new time point, a new vector appears in each space. Now because the uh, voxels are poorly aligned across subjects, especially in terms of the fine detail, you can't really see much similarity between the, this cloud of clusters for these time points and this cloud of clusters. Everything is coded, by the way, so that the same colored shape uh, is, indicates the same time po point. So here's a red triangle here, was a red triangle and subject two is over here, et cetera. So the idea is somehow we want to bring this subject um, representational geometry in alignment with this subject's representational geometry. And we do that with rotation. So we start with this subject uh, representational geometry. And now we're going to rotate this with a three-dimensional rotation. Looks like that. And you can see it looks just now they look very similar to each other. And so we now we have a rotation matrix, this thing right here, that we've calculated using the Procrustes transformation that allows us to rotate this subject's voxel space into a common space where the information is lined up across subjects. With a third subject, we need a subject-specific, a, a, a new transformation matrix, to bring this subject's pattern vectors in alignment with the first two subjects' pattern vectors. And again, that's a rotation. And now you can see that everything is clustered together in the common information space. That's the essence of hyperalignment. And um, I'm going to skip ahead to what does this do to the intersubject similarity of representational geometry. And uh, with the anatomically aligned data, we get a very credit, uh, fairly high correlation of representational geometry even for these smaller searchlights. And this representational geometry we're looking at is the uh, geometry for the movie. So with Andy's data, we're looking at similarity between six species or, um, or 12 species. In uh, the, the face uh, study, I think we had six, there were 16 stimuli, 20 stimuli. So it was a 20, uh, 20 stimulus similarity space. With the movie, we have 1,300 time points. And we look at the similarity and the pattern of response for all pairs of time points. So that's about 800,000 pairwise similarities. We're now collecting data uh, uh, with a one second TR. So we have over 3,000 time points for the movie. So we're looking at a similarity space with about, uh, I think it's four or five million pairwise similarities. And so these similarities are the similarities between the representational dissimilarity structures, uh, matrices, for 800,000 pairwise comparisons. But uh, after hyperalignment, this uh, similarity of representational geometry increases dramatically. That's because with hyperalignment, there's a step I didn't go over. We actually kind of rearrange the information across the cortical surface so that each searchlight has a, a, a more uh, intersubject 
uh, consist has a more intersubject consistency in the information that's represented, and that's reflected by a doubling of the um, yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about that at the end of the talk, OK? And, and, and the guy who does the work is sitting right in front of you. <laughs> um, um, the, the, the whole purpose of this is to find what's shared across brains, right? And all I talked about for the first eight years was what's shared across brains. But now we're starting to discover that the, the residual differences after we've kind of optimized the similarity across brains are very meaningful and very, con and very consistent, very reliable. So now we can analyze how the second order representational geometry for movie data. So we say, how does the, this representational similarity structure change region to region while uh, uh, in the movie? And what we did was we identified 20 regions of interest that are associated with different cognitive functions, like early vision, V1, motion vision, word form area, face area, some auditory areas, including voice area, music area, and some uh, cognitive uh, functions like calculations, expressive speech, and working memory. And we, now, now what we're looking at is this similarity of similarity structures. It's really the same thing I was talking about in those multidimensional scaling plots. So we start with a similarity structure in a searchlight A and a similar structure in a searchlight B, and we vectorize those similarity structures and look at the correlation between those similarity structures. And you can see that there's a lot of structure here that looks meaningful. V1 is very different from everything else. The visual areas are most similar to each other, and the auditory areas are most similar to each other, and the auditory and visual areas are very different from each other in terms of their representational geometry during movie viewing. And the, co and the um, cognitive areas are a little bit more complicated. Now, it's really hard to look at a matrix like this and try to really figure out what it means. So we have to revert to some other way of visualizing our data, which is um, multidimensional scaling. So we project all these pairwise similarities. So this is uh, nearly 200 pairwise similarities. Okay. And we project those into a two-dimensional or three-dimensional spaces. So this is a three-dimensional, multi-dimensional scaling. And the color-coded visual areas in red, auditory areas in blue, and cognitive areas in green. And you can see that dimension one distinguishes between vision and audition with these cognitive areas somewhere in between. And dimension two uh, distinguishes between V1 and everything else. And then dimension three pulls the cognitive areas away from the, per, the sensory perceptual areas. So uh, this really get, re reflects what you would expect uh, the differences to be in the cognitive maps in these different cortical fields during natural movie viewing. And it gets even more interesting if you, if you do it multidimensional scaling only on the visual areas, or multidimensional scaling only on the auditory areas. So dimension one distinguishes early vision from high level vision. Dimension two distinguishes motion vision from word form and face area from the place area. And you know, the auditory system, it's similar. Dimension one is distinguishing between A1 and the higher level uh, uh, areas. Now dimension two is distinguishing between right, area, right hemisphere areas and left hemisphere areas. But there's a lot of information now in the second order co cognitive map, the cognitive map of cognitive maps. And um, so uh, uh, Matteo Visconti di Leggio Costello, I challenge you to say that yourself, <laughs> and uh, Yara Kalchenko, working with Ida Gobini, uh, applied this kind of analysis to the face system. So they identified face areas from an independent fMRI study. And then they went back to the movie data to look at how are these face areas related to each other in terms of the representational geometry during movie viewing. And it's a beautiful structure. You have the early visual areas here. This is the ventral core system for face perception. These purple areas are the dorsal core system. Here's the anterior core system. Um, and then there are areas for theory of mind and the precuneus. 
And you can see there's even a progression from posterior to anterior areas along these pathways. So there's a very meaningful, uh, well-behaved uh, structure to this second-order geometry that tells us how these processing pathways are, um, uh, are constructed or organized. And so from this, they uh, developed this uh, revised model of the face perception system that starts with the early visual areas and then splits into a ventral pathway and a dorsal pathway, which we had talked about before. But this now, sh uh, and we, the ventral pathway is more interested, is more concerned with representation of the invariant aspects of faces, whereas the dorsal pathway is more uh, concerned with the um, movable or changeable aspects of faces, things like expression, where, whereas identity doesn't change uh, across different expressions or different head angles. And everything seems to come together in this inferior front out, frontal area that has that identity, um, representation of identity that is invariant across head angle. So all these uh, treatments of second order geometry uh, that I've shown you so far, we divide the brain into clusters or, or functionally defined areas. This increase in, represent, in inter subject correlation between subjects suggests there's an even finer grain scale to changes in representational geometry across a processing pathway. Because if you rearrange the information a little bit, then the um, inter subject correlation doubles. Uh, so it, it suggests that, you know. The, the best way to make a, a computational model of processing pathways may not be region by region by region, cutting the brain up into, into parcels, but really thinking about more as a smooth transition as information that is critical for um, behavior or a decision becomes disentangled from confounding information. Do you have a sense of how uh, extreme the, those kind of rotation matrices are and whether there's any sort of interesting across? That's what I want to study next. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's a really critical question. So a quick, uh, uh, Sam Nastase, here's Sam, having a cup of espresso on the streets of Rovereto, Italy. He did a really cool study where he had uh, subjects looking at video clips of animals behaving. And these are truly beautiful uh, videos. So he has videos of three different taxonomic classes, primates, birds, and insects, all doing the same thing. They're running. So you can see the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the motion vectors associated with these different kinds of behavior are completely different for these three animals. But you see them, and you can, everyone says, yeah, they're all running. It's very clear. That's what the similarity is. Now here we have three animals eating. And I had to find, some, I had somebody in an audience once who finally told me what's going on here. This is a caterpillar <laughs> eating its own shell after it, it hatched from its shell, from its egg. And again, you can see that the motion vectors f for feeding is very different, but you know that they're all eating. And then you can also look at the same taxonomic category like primates with baboons or uh, gorillas and uh, doing very different things, fighting, or running or eating. So when he looked at this, he looked at the similarity structure when pe people were either attending to the similarity of behavior. So uh, they would see a sequence of, uh, um, of videos, and they would say, with each one, they would say whether or not the current video was the same behavior as the previous video, regardless of uh, taxonomic category. In another task, it would see this, essentially the same sequence of videos, but that this time they would say, is the taxonomic class the same as the previous video? So when they're attending to the behavior, it pushes the vectors for the different behaviors out relative to the, the, uh, uh, when they're attending to taxonomy. And then in the same thing, if they're attending to taxonomy, it increases the distances between the vectors for the different taxonomic categories as compared to when they're attending to behavior. So attention also is distorting 
these, um, uh, this representational geometry to enhance the representation of the attended feature, the attended information. And again, uh, uh, Dillers yesterday talked about how learning really can, can radically change the representational geometry. So, okay. This is uh, the work on individual differences. So, uh, uh, done by uh, Fei Long Ma, he's right there in the third row. And what he did was he looked at a, a, another kind of dissimilarity matrix. He would vectorize the uh, um, data for a searchlight in one subject and vectorize it in a second subject and see how similar those two subjects are to each other. So you get a measure in the difference between two brains in a searchlight. And you can do that simply by looking at the inner subject correlation. You can do that for all pairs of subjects and you get an individual differences matrix. Okay, this is another kind of, of, of uh, vector geometry, but now it's an individual differences geometry. And you can repeat that on independent data, two halves of the movie or whatever, and see whether or not the people who are different from each other are still different from each other, and are the people who are similar to each other still similar to each other. And actually, they're highly correlated. So this one is correlated at 0.77. So these, that's the reliability of this individual differences matrix, yes? Does this assume that the time course of the mental processing is the same across subjects? Like, I guess I'm imagining a scenario where one person represents things in exactly the same way as another person, but one TR is slower. Like, would this capture that, or would they look totally different? They would look different. Okay. They would look different, yeah. Um, so after we hyperlined the data, and then looked at the similarity between subjects in the hyperline data. So this is essentially looking at the residuals around that shared representational geometry. And we thought that the reliability would go down because we're factoring out all this shared variance across subjects based on anatomy. And it actually went up quite dramatically. So it went from 0.77 to 0.84 in this particular example. So this is the, uh, a searchlight analysis of reliabilities of these individual differences matrices in anatomically aligned data. And you can see they're quite high, especially in you know, the lateral, uh, temporal, occipital, parietal, and prefrontal cortices. Um, after hyperalignment, they go up dramatically. So the individual differences are much more reliable uh, in, the, um, in the hyperaligned data. No, the, 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 sim, the, the, the similarities are less reliable across repetition. So people who are very similar in one session may be quite different in another. And that's because we think that the, the signal we're getting from sensory motor cortex is not very meaningful because people are lying in a scanner and they're doing nothing. They're, you know. So there's more noise. There's more noise in, 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 the, in the signal in those areas. And this is just a scatter plot showing uh, searchlight by searchlight the value of reliability for the anatomically aligned data versus the hyperaligned data. And you can see almost everything is on uh, the north side of the diagonal. So, um, so then uh, we were puzzling over this, and I, I was stumped. And Fei Long came up with a really good idea of dividing the data into the information that's encoded in coarse scale topographies as compared to fine scale topographies. So for each searchlight, he looked at how similar people are in terms of their average time series for the, all the, the, the vertices in the, that searchlight. So that's the coarse scale. It's the average across you know, uh, a cortical patch of about uh, three centimeters across. And then he, looked, then he, he subtracted that average time series out from each vertex and looked at how similar they are in the residual time series that vary vertex by vertex. So that's the fine scale structure in the um, representational geometry. And so for the coarse scale individual differences matrices, 
The anatomically aligned data and the hyperaligned data give very similar patterns of uh, reliability of about the same magnitude. But when we look at the fine scale, that's where you see the advantage. So this kind of, you know, the light bulb went on at this point. So what is happening is that because these, uh, this information that's encoded in differences in fine scale topography are really blurred after anatomical alignment because one subject's vertices are not in alignment with another subject's vertices, you can't see how they differ from each other in that information. So that, that was obscured. Now that we can align the data using hyperalignment, align, now we can look at how they differ in that information that's encoded in the fine scale topographies. And um, all of the previous work on individual differences has, used more, has only used a core scale uh, measure rather than the fine scale measure. Yeah, Adam. This blue pad, that's actually ventral temporal. Uh, hyperline map. Oh, there it is, yeah, okay. I was just focusing on hyperline map. Does that mean that a subject is more similar to other people than they are to themselves? It, it, it means that they're, they're right, right around zero. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, we have, so the, the next question is, is, these more reliable differences, do they mean anything? And so um, Fei Long, who just finished his, uh, uh, defended his dissertation uh, recently, has now analyzed whether you can predict behavior from these patterns. And this is actually an analysis of resting state functional connectivity. Um, and he, from this, he tried to predict general intelligence, or G. And he did this on a publicly available database, which is the Human Connectome Project, with over a 1,000 brains. And what you can see is that the uh, prediction, and this, this slide is out of date. Uh, it is not, it, it's not the, the, the final analysis that was in his dissertation and will soon be in a paper. But um, this tells the same story which is the prediction is much stronger after the data have been hyperaligned than after they've been aligned based on anatomy. And that this increase is due primarily to the fine scale difference, the differences uh, that are embedded in the fine scale topographies. And um, if I'm not mistaken, I think your prediction of G has really outperformed all previous reports. Yeah. So I'm a little bit over, I apologize, but I'm gonna finish, wrap up now. So these are the main points I wanna make. First of all, we th when we talk about maps of neural cognitive spaces, we're analyzing them as the representational geometry that we can measure with functional brain imaging. You can measure this with other things too. People have done really nice studies of uh, RSA with MEG data, for example. And you can use behavior, and I've shown you how you can merge behavior and, um, and, um, and computational models with the, uh, represent the, the cognitive maps uh, measured from uh, brain data. This representational similarity is highly similar across subjects, which means that there's shared information and it's encoded, but it's encoded in idiosyncratic individual topographies. And so uh, to, uh, uh, to be able to analyze that shared information, we needed a, a method like hyperalignment that allowed us to uh, look at the shared information uh, independently of the individual topography. The representational cha geometry changes across pathways. So this is a second order geometry. It's a map of nested maps. And I think this is really what the, the, the information structure in the brain is. That thinking about one area in isolation uh, misses that this, this information really exists in an, an interconnected, interacting pathway. And so it models how, process, how information is processed and also how different types of information are disentangled in different branches of pathways. Attention warps the representational geometry and so does learning. And there are individual differences in information that are encoded in the fine scale topographies. These are the residuals around shared geom vector geometry and these are more reliable 
and more predictive than the, uh, the course scale. Uh, differences based on course scale information. And so I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes? A couple of questions. Got one already right here. Yeah, I mean, we, you see, we, we have kind of a different view of connectivity. Rather than thinking that information is past and there's a copy of the information in the next area, we think it's processed. <laughs> and so, you know, you can, you, can, you can study connectivity as, you know, are two, th two things oscillating with each other, or do they have representational geometries that are correlated but different? And we think the second approach is more informative about what that connectivity is. And these areas that you know, are, have correlated geometries are areas that also show s simple functional connectivity. So these are connected areas. In the time, in, in, in the time factors? Yeah, we, we, we're not looking at that. So we, at this point, we're really looking at the representational geometry kind of averaged across a, a longish experiment. And, and, and Jeremy actually is doing some very interesting things looking how the geometry changes time point by time point, time point through these naturalistic stimuli. But we haven't really leveraged that yet to, to look at individual differences in that. But it's a very important point. Yeah. How much do you think this is due to uh, regularities that are being, that the uh, brains are trying to actually track? A hundred percent. Yeah, I think that, you know, the, the, the... Well, I mean, that's compared to underlying, like, anatomical processes. Right. right? How, how much of, of this is... Well, that's an easy, e easy question. Okay. <laughs> Not. <laughs> okay. Uh, that we, we know that there are similarities across brain that are surprising. I mean, why is the face area in the same place, right. roughly, in everybody's brain? Um, why does every brain seem to represent uh, Gabor filters in, in V1 cortex, right? Well, there are surprising things like um, deep neural networks generate Gabor filters in the first layers. They aren't told to generate those Gabor filters. So there's something about visual stimuli that lends itself to uh, being analyzed with Gabor filters. So are those Gabor filters um, genetically determined? Are we, you know, are, we, are we designed to find those? Or does the brain develop those tuning functions? Because those are the regularities that also deep neural networks find. And, you know, and then the tuning functions higher up are very chaotic, to, to say the least. If you look at papers, you know, like from Logothetis, earlier papers from Logothetis, about the tuning functions for single neurons in uh, IT cortex, they have crazy tuning properties. They'll, they'll respond to leopards and toasters, right? And you say, what's the similarity between a leopard and a toaster? And the, uh, so somehow these tuning functions are developed to support this information structure. And the tuning function for an individual neuron may not make a lot of sense, whereas the, rep the population responses make a lot of sense. And those population responses are being, uh, are, uh, are reflecting these statistics of the world. So we know that, you know, pop-up toasters are like, you know, uh, countertop ovens and microwaves, right? And so, you know, we, we develop this knowledge and that's why we can talk to each other because we have shared understanding about how concepts are related to each other because we both live in the same world and our brains have developed uh, um, representational schemes to uh, uh, represent the same similarity structure with, with indiv interesting individual differences. Yeah. Is there any missing information in those uh, foot space transformation matrices? In which? Uh, the, the rotation matrix that you used, the dot one and three. Is there anything useful about those, or is it just something that we did? Um, that's something that we're actually planning on, on, on getting into because 
the, the, the differences we've looked at, individual differences, are really differences in how information is represented. So you can imagine that, you know, for example, uh, if you have a, a, a set of faces and some of those faces are, are personally familiar to you, right, like people in your family, you can have much better defined distinctions between those faces than I would because I don't know your, your family, right? And so the, the representational geometry, if you, after you align it, the distances will reflect things like expertise for face familiarity, expertise for, um, you know, uh, whatever. I mean, I, I, I worked around a lot of monkey neurophysiologists when I was at NIH. They remembered every single monkey, especially Leslie Ungulator. She remembered every single monkey she had ever worked with. Um, you know, whereas for most people, a monkey is a monkey. You don't, know, you, know, you don't really see how they, they look different from each other. So these, these are going to be reflected in the information in the, in the population response vectors. But this other question is, you know, the transformation matrices may reflect things like, why does one person have a big FFA and another person has a small FFA? Why is one person's FFA more anterior and one person's FFA more posterior? That should all be embedded in the transformation matrices. And we're trying to figure out how to extract that and look at those differences. Last question, and then we'll take a short minute break while Jamie set up. So, yeah, it's super cool that like the hyper alignment can sort of reveal more similarities than the anatomical alignment. I was wondering, does it matter what kind of stimuli you use to like um, do the hyper alignment? Like, for example, if you use the very simple visual stimuli or like complex. Yeah, it, it makes a huge difference. If you have a, an experiment with a very limited set of uninteresting stimuli, especially if they're non-dynamic stimuli, the transformation matrices have much less general validity. So you really need the kind of rich um, uh, set of brain states that you get with a movie, which engages multiple cognitive systems in parallel um, to, uh, to estimate those parameters. I mean, we're estimating transformation matrices for a searchlight with 200, with rotations around 200 axes. That's a lot of parameters that you're trying to, to fine tune. So you need a lot of data to, to get that right. 